Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with Developer University. For more of my training videos for beginners, please visit me at devu.com. Now in this lesson, we want to start the process of dissecting that little application that we wrote in the previous lesson. Now previously, I wanted you to focus on the workflow, what we did and how we did it. But now what I want to do is focus on why we did what we did. It's really crucial at this point that we cement some really important ideas in your mind because they're going to provide the basis, the foundation for everything that comes next. So what I want to do is start on the inside and kind of work our way out. And I'll start by talking about the nature of writing code. When you learn how to write applications with C Sharp, really any programming language, learning the syntax of C Sharp, or in other words, learning the nouns and the verbs and the punctuation of the programming language is really just half the battle. The other half of the battle is learning about related pre-built functionality that's available to the code that you write. Now in our case, Microsoft has created something called the .NET Framework, which sounds kind of spooky and mysterious. Uh, but it's really not that bad. It's actually pretty large, but we're only going to focus on two specific portions of it for our purposes. Uh, the first part that I want to focus on is something called the class library, which is simply just a library of code that Microsoft wrote to take care of difficult tasks so that we as software developers, we don't have to worry about them. So there's library code to help with many common sorts of things that many applications will need. Uh, things like uh, working with math or working with strings and text and working with dates manipulating dates and times, um, maybe displaying things to the computer screen or transmitting information across a network. Um, so a lot of that kind of foundational stuff that would be difficult for us to write and is utilized by many different applications. So that's really the first part. It's taking advantage and understanding the class library of the .NET Framework. The second part of the .NET Framework is called the runtime. It's also known as the common language runtime. You'll see it called as the CLR as well. And really it's just this protective bubble that wraps around your application. Your application lives inside of it. It runs inside of that protective bubble. And uh, it essentially takes care of a lot of the low level details uh, so that you, the software developer, you can focus on what your application is supposed to do, not worry so much about how it's actually accomplishing it under the hood. You don't have to worry about the computer's operating system interacting with it and interacting with memory and interacting with you know the hardware of the computer itself. Many of those things are kind of abstracted away from you. You don't have to worry about them. Uh, furthermore, the CLR, that runtime, also provides a layer of protection for the end user so that you, the malicious, evil software developer, you can't do something really bad to somebody's computer without them at least giving you permission to do it in the first place. So uh, without their knowledge and their approval, you're not going to be able to wipe out their entire hard drive, for example. Uh, for right now, it's the .NET Framework class library that I really want to focus on because it's what we used, whether you realize it or not, whenever we were writing our first application. So, for example, in lines 13 and 14 where we did our work, uh, you see console.writeLine and then we used open parenthesis, close parenthesis, and so on. Um, we were using code in the framework class library that knows how to display text into a console window. All we got to do is say, hey, use this text, stick it in a window. And we don't really care how it does its job, we just care that it did it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so the next line of code, this console.read line, uh, it was also really important. We're telling the application to wait for input from the end user before continuing its execution. So uh, again, here we're calling code in the .NET Framework class library that knows how to accept user input. You recall that I use the enter key on the keyboard and then the application 
continued on, it exited, and we were back into Visual Studio. So in both of those lines of code, we were utilizing uh, methods that were defined, that were created by somebody at Microsoft to handle that interaction with displaying and retrieving, uh, retrieving data from the end user. So what were to happen if we were to comment out that line of code? And here to comment out a line of code, uh, I use two forward slashes on my computer. It's over the question mark. Uh, and commenting out code simply means that I want those instructions to be ignored. Now, I, I could have just deleted that line of code completely, but I might want it later. So maybe I don't want to remove it completely. I just don't want to, I just want to ignore it for now. Okay. Uh, I also might use code comments to write myself some notes to remind myself of something about the application in the future. We'll talk about code comments a little bit later. But if we were to run the application now, watch what happens. Okay, it ran and it's already done. What happened? Well, you might have seen a flicker on screen for like a fraction of a second. Uh, the reason was because, hey, it executed this one line of code and it said, well, looks like I'm done here. And it exits out of the application by adding the read line we're now stopping execution waiting for the end user to do something before exiting out okay so hopefully that makes sense all right so next let's talk about the position of the code that we wrote i made sure to emphasize that you have to write the code in the correct place and the correct place was in the in between the opening and closing curly braces of that innermost set of curly braces as defined kind of by the uh, by the level of indentation that we saw in the boilerplate code. Uh, so if you don't add the code there, we saw what the ramification of that was, right? The application, you'll try to run it. It'll give you a runtime error. Uh, the correct place for that code was where we have it right now, in between that opening and closing curly brace that you see on screen. Now, as you can see, there's several sets of curly braces, and so it's important that we talk about what these do. And I need to oversimplify things here. We will come back and fill in some of the details later. Uh, but essentially, you have an opening and closing set of curly braces, and those define a code block. And code blocks typically have names, and they have purposes. So in this particular case, we have a first code block, and this code block has the name main. Okay, uh, And this particular code block is known as a method, and this particular method, is, by convention, is the very first method that's called whenever your application is executed. All right, And so... I don't want you to worry about these other words, static and void, and even the string and the args for right now. We'll talk about those later on. Uh, but this entire code block here, as well as the line above it, they define something called a method. And a method is simply a block of code that has a name. Now, later on, you're going to come to realize that a method is so much more than that. But I want to use that as a working definition as we're getting started here. The method has a name. And when you have a name, you can call a name and say, I want you to execute. All right. Uh, and so we'll talk about methods again a little bit more in a little while. This main method lives inside of another set of curly braces. And that set of curly braces also have a name. The name is program. It's a class called program. And so you can think of a class as simply a container for all of the methods of your application. You can kind of keep the methods that are related to each other in separate classes. Uh, now, what do I mean by related to each other? Well, that's really for you, the developer, to decide. As you get deeper into programming, you're going to come to understand the thought process behind organizing your code. But that's a little ways off for now. Just trust me on that. Uh, now, I, I said that a class was merely a way to, to organize your methods. It is so much more than that. And again, I'm way oversimplifying this as we're getting started here. But the main takeaway for, for right now is that, uh, that code is organized in curly brace containers and you have some blocks of code that reside inside of other blocks of code. And to kind of emphasize that again, here we have another set of curly braces and 
this set of curly braces has a name as well. In fact, it's a namespace called Hello World, which happens to be the name of the application that we gave it. Uh, again, keep things extremely simple here. A namespace is just another way of organizing code. Again, at some point it becomes so much more than that, but let's keep it simple for now. Uh, so let's take a look at this at these lines of code and kind of illustrate these ideas about namespaces that contain program uh, classes that contain methods. Here, what we're doing whenever we're calling console.writeLine line is we're actually making a call into the .NET Framework class library. Remember, it's that library of code supplied by Microsoft, and we're saying in that entire library there's a book and there's a there's a chapter inside of that book that I want to reference. All right. So in this case, we're saying that book is the console book, the class. And I want you to look at the chapter named right line that has the definition for this method. All right, hopefully that analogy works for you. Uh, but we're looking inside of a library to find a class, and we're going to call a particular method inside of that class. And by using its name, we can execute all the code that was written inside of that method. Same with the method that's def that we're calling below it as well. Notice that there is a period that we use between the name of the class and the method name and we use that uh, it's called a member accessor it allows us to access a member of the class or in other words now that we know what the book is we can find out what chapter we want to reference okay hopefully that analogy works for you um, now notice also that both whenever we call the write line method and the read line method that they both have parentheses following them. Now in the case of the right line method, we're actually sticking something in between the opening and closing parentheses, whereas in the read line method we're not. But essentially those uh, uh, those parentheses are saying not only do we want to reference that particular class method name, but the parentheses mean I want you to actually invoke it, execute it, do it now. Okay, so that's the purpose for those parentheses. Now, we can say do it now and pass in information. Do it now with this stuff, <laughs> with this argument. So we're passing in an argument to the right line method and saying we want you to do it right to write this to screen and here's what we want you to write. So it's an input parameter to the method named right line. Okay. Now don't worry, we're going to come back to the notion of methods in the future, as well as passing values into a method like we did in, in, as we passed in the, the literal string hello world into our method here. Uh, just know that whenever you see parentheses after a given word in your code, you should be thinking that that code is being called right now as we step through the execution of the code. Next up, let's talk about the semicolon. We've already kind of explained it in the previous video, but just to kind of emphasize it, notice that almost everything, even these statements at the very top, have semicolons with the exception of whenever we're defining a namespace, a class, or a, uh, a method. And we said at the time that the semicolons are actually similar to the period or exclamation mark or question mark at the end of an English sentence. It completes a thought in C sharp. Now some programming languages, like Visual Basic for example, they don't really have this idea. They only allow one complete thought per line of code. However, with C sharp, you could, you could do this, what I'm about to do, watch. Okay, now I have both of those lines of code on a single line. All right, and if we run the application, it'll work just as it did before. All right, so the way that you separate or indicate that you have two different complete thoughts is through the use of a semicolon. Furthermore, we could put lines of code uh, on separate lines like this. Now, it wouldn't make sense in this case uh, because the line of code is so short. It actually makes it difficult to read, but sometimes when you have a very, 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 very long line of code, you'll see me split that line of code into multiple lines. 
and still the application will execute. Now, in other programming languages, you wouldn't have that behavior, all right? Because really, white space and line feeds and things of that nature, they don't matter to C-sharp. The only thing that really matters is, um, is to, to indicate a complete thought is a, uh, is a semicolon at the end of the line. Let me go ahead and get rid of all that. And the other thing that I want to mention here that you may have noticed is the level of indentation that you get automatically from Visual Studio. Now that's completely optional and Visual Studio nudges you in the right direction but uh, essentially even if you were to kind of come out here and we'll, we'll use the tab key several times and write the word console dot right line something like that and, and notice that that Visual Studio re-indented it for us. Why do you suppose it did that? Well, many people believe that indentation helps the readability of the code so that you can see uh, what code container, where code resides inside of the other curly braces inside of your application. All right. And so kind of along those same lines for readability's sake, notice that there are many different colors that are used as text inside of this text editor window. You have these royal blue colors, and these are my default colors. Yours might look a little bit different, but by default, I think uh, you have some royal blue, some black. You have aqua color here. This is a dark red. You have some light gray and light blue. All right, and all of those are used to help you identify the, the parts of speech, I guess you can say, inside of the code that you write. All right, we'll talk more about that as we talk more about the syntax of C-sharp in an upcoming lesson. Okay. All right, so now that we've talked about the code that we wrote and its position and formatting and white space and tabs and all that sort of stuff, what I want to do is stop right now for this video, and in the next one I want to talk about the files themselves, uh, the file that we typed our code into, how that relates to projects and even solutions, what happened when we saved our project, what happened when we actually ran our project, and so we'll do that in the very next, in the very next lesson. We'll see you there. Thanks.